And welcome back to Edric Poonin Company, the podcast where anybody can inspire everybody. I'm Edric, and this week on the Epic Podcast, we have Mr. Ramesh Mutusami, founder and CEO of All Vigor. Alvigor is a multidisciplinary change management consultancy based here in Singapore. And we're going to be looking into what's good for organizations, training uh, to be a better speaker, and also my personal favorite, finding your purpose. So let's get this podcast started. Hey, hi, Ramesh. Hey, Edric. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, thanks so much for doing this on a Sunday, man. I mean, like uh, when, when I got your text, you were like, hey, let's do this on Sunday. I've got, I'm busy <laughs> training all week long. And not only that, now, then after that, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm settling the kids right now. I'm like, whoa, wow. <laughs> you are like the busiest man on the planet right now. Uh, I, I wouldn't say busy, but I think, uh, you know, when you do your own business, you just become... Um, more flexible with time, you know, because you don't really have a nine to five. So you find wherever the pockets of time are and say, okay, let's do this. And I thought Sunday is a nice day, it's a relaxed day. So we're going to have a nice catch up and some chit chat as well. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much for that, man. I really appreciate it. You know, um, one thing that I've always been meaning to ask you, I mean, from the days that we kind of worked together, I mean, very, very, um, uh, sporadically, I think, uh, in the previous organization, um, you've always struck me as someone who is extremely, extremely eloquent, very well prepared when it comes to um, the things that you needed to do. Um, but before we get into all of that, right, uh, would you be able to just tell us a little bit more, uh, or the, our listeners a little bit more about uh, Alvega? Oh, okay, so Alvega is an organization that specializes in change management. Uh, you know, for companies and individuals, when they want to go from point A to point B, like a goal, they usually will have to undertake some changes. And for an organization, they need to plan these changes. They need to manage how this entire process rolls out. So that's when we come in to do their workshops, their facilitation. We've, we give guidance to the change uh, steering team as well. So that's what we do at the heart of uh, everything that we do. Yeah. So that's what change uh, Elvega really does. Yeah, I mean, change management is a huge, huge topic. You know, it's not just yeah. about HR, but it's really organizational development. So, uh, yeah. whoever is listening out there, whether you're C suite, middle management, or even somebody starting up, go down to the website uh, A L V I G O R Alvigor dot com. Uh, have a look at the courses because it's huge amount of uh, content over there for you to go and take a look at. And also, that I mean, look, uh, it covers anything from finding your purpose getting your sales pitches together, your keynote speaking abilities, and of course, on the larger scale of change or management and organizational development. It's um, pretty amazing what you have done, you know. I mean, back then, <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you, you started off, yeah, you have started such a great speaking career, you know, yeah. and um, what I wanted to also understand was how did you even get Alvega started? That one is okay. something that is always a, a keynote story for me, lah. Okay, sure. Um, I started in the training and development business uh, a bit by accident because uh, I didn't really get a chance to go to university and I had to, because of family situation, so I had to start working and, you know, when you have to just get going, I did relief teaching for MOE and then slowly I started to do some debates coaching because I was uh, formerly doing a lot of debates in my junior college days and then I stumbled into a youth training company and then I stayed there for a long time. And within the company, I was given an opportunity to try out corporate training. So I started by doing uh, team building trainings. So I did that for quite a while. And then I realized like, okay, do all of these workshops and trainings, do they actually deliver the results? So I began, you know, as I talked to more CEOs, general managers and HR, the key thing is they need the results. So what brings the results? That's when my mind got opened up into organizational psychology, industrial mm -hmm. and organizational psychology. And I realized oh, there's a lot of other things that we need to look at in order for uh, for the change to really happen. So then I said, okay, uh, because where I was then working didn't really have the infrastructure. Neither was it the goal of the organization at that point mm. to do um, like OD work, organizational development work. Yeah. So I spent like four years to really study and understand what are the, the pain points of HR. And then I started my uh, little tiny organization uh, with the blessings of um, you know a lot of people and that's how we got got moving and today you know when i take a look back within just these six years 
we have done so many, uh, uh, you know, OD projects, uh, both locally and regionally. It just blows my mind. I mean, you just put your mind to it and you just uh, throw caution to the wind and just go. And the going will be tough, uh, I, I, I promise. <laughs> but you'll pick yourself up. You will learn a lot of new things. And it's all worth it at the end of the day, in my opinion. Right. And then, uh, sorry of Elvig. <laughs> okay, okay. So this is the abridged version la, of the yeah. entire journey. I mean, but six years. Oh, sorry. You yeah. spent four years studying yeah. um, uh, OD in itself. But yeah. that's the thing. Um, didn't you need to like at least get accreditation from uh, IHRP or something like that? No. Um, I think uh, in Singapore, because these are not licensed, right? They are mm. not uh, like you don't have to be licensed to do something. And I think this also uh, stops a lot of people from trying new things because we yeah. we think we need a lot of uh, uh, credentials. Um, and But I think what you need is um, a lot of study, right? So study can be done by yourself if you are self-organized and you are able to put your mind to it and you work towards it. And having mentors and practitioners uh, give you advice really makes a lot of difference. So I'm not saying that these credentials and certificates don't help. But I don't think they need to be the defining thing that uh, says, okay, you can or cannot do something. Uh, but I already at that point had done my ACTA. I had a couple of like uh, psychometric profiling tool certifications like MBTI. So I had a couple of those things. Then I said, okay, I'm going to do it. But I did do a specialist diploma in uh, organizational psychology, not because I needed the credential, but because I really wanted to learn. Uh, I wanted to know more about that topic, speak to the professors and and like, oh, okay, so this is what this topic is all about and where can I uh, be value adding to the space? Yeah, And learning is a like an ongoing thing, right? You right. have to constantly keep up. Today, people are talking about agile organization, industrial uh, transformation 4.0, digitalization. So it's never ending. You got to keep uh, moving up the the learnings, uh, learning uh, ladder, if you can call it, yeah. Mm. And one thing that Edric loves, Edric loves freebies, and I would love to give whoever is listening out there freebies. If you can do this for us, right? Sure. I know it's a huge, huge issue uh, about how I can tell when I need OD, for example. Yeah, sure. uh, OD in the sense of, of course, organizational development. Of course, no, we're not <laughs> talking about overdosing, okay? Yeah. So the top three telltale signs, Do you, you've spoken to so many people over... Yeah the years and what are the most common telltale signs that you go wow this is something alarm bells are ringing it's time yeah. for me to really look into this okay so the three telltale signs is number one your business model right so if your business model needs to have a change right because you realize that the way you're running your business it's either not giving you the kind of um a returns and you decide that okay i want to shift into something different so that change in business model is definitely one thing that um, is a telltale sign. The second element is um, the people, right? So when you want to make these changes, you got to ask yourself this question, how is it going to impact the people in the organization? If the people are going to be confused, they are stressed out, they forget the purpose, and uh, there could be legacy issues, meaning people could say things like, oh, the company has always been like this. How come we are doing this? So people get disorientated. So the second area, uh, telltale sign, is really the people aspect of it. Do you think mm. your people will be able to manage the change? And I think the third one is when you want to build um, an organization where people are included, you know, where people are, are, are caught up, sort of like brought into the change process. Because what is the alternative of doing OD would be to just uh, push things down or ram it down their throat without really consultation. So if you do it that way, people learn, okay, so this is a very you know, hierarchical, disconnected organization. And you're going to have a lot of side effects, like innovation will go down because nobody wants to really uh, open up, share their ideas or concepts. You know, people will be guarded. They're always very worried what the top always says. And it, that kind of a, a, a model may not work for a business in today's uh, generation. So the three telltale signs would be, firstly, if you notice your business model has to change dramatically, you definitely need OD. Uh, number two is when the people aspect of it, you realize they need the support to make the transition. And the last one, to build an inclusive uh, organization where everybody's involved in the change journey, then you would do OD. So uh, tough question, but I think, you know, having done it a couple of times, I realized these are the things that um, the, pr the practitioners, right, the c clients often ask. And that's how I derive these three telltale signs. Thank you so much for that. And... Um, when we talk about change management, I mean, 
Agreed. this like what you talked about was was around about the people right mm -hmm. sometimes the purpose is lost or we don't get the vision or the mission you know so we're no longer aligned um during this period of of covid especially you know so many people were having challenges and business transformations mm -hmm. not yeah. i mean let's not even talk about digital transformation just business mm -hmm. transformation which is even yeah. bigger many people had to really adjust and um did you also have to adjust during that period oh, to change oh, yeah. and yeah, in, in, oh increase goodness. the number of courses. What do you all need to do? So, what, what were the things that people were asking you to do now? So I know it sounds like, it seems like a long time ago, but in my mind, it's really fresh. So it was the end of 2019. So the general practice is normally we will lock in some of the key dates for some of the big clients uh, at least a month or two before the year starts, right? That's how the large MNCs work. Mm. And then when the COVID situation kind of like hit, um, I think at the beginning, it was just wait and see what's going to happen. So January came. And then by February, I think the situation escalated. But it was still sort of like only advisories. And then the circuit breaker, I think, kicked in somewhere in March, if I'm not wrong, in 2020. Right. And around that time, we had almost 100% cancellation of almost every cost because we could not go to venues. Um, and I was scheduled to travel a bit in Asia, right, to different companies to train. And everything got uh, cancelled. And it kind of like was okay. And it's not my first time at the rodeo. I've been uh -huh. through, you know, pretty tough situations in the past. So my go-to is to kind of just relax, you know, get my center. And I ask myself, what's the worst case scenario? And it was also fortunate the Singapore government, they were giving a lot of grants and mm. they worked with the banks to kind of... So our banks were calling us up, hey, do you need a lifeline? Do you need a... So my finance person, right, and my co-founder, he decided, okay, we'll go see how much money uh, they are going to give us for the time being. So we managed to get that, to get some space above the, the water. But we knew that it was, a, you know, it was just a rope and it was a matter of how long you have before the rope mm. runs out. And then we had one client because... You see, the clients are also were affected by the changes, right? Like they couldn't do anything. Uh, they couldn't book any rooms. They couldn't bring people together. But the development aspect of it, the, the, the things that have to be done still needs to progress as much as possible. So they still needed uh, some level of OD work, some level of facilitation work. But okay, what do they do? So they then called us up and they said, hey, can you guys do like online uh, courses? And up to that point, I have never done online courses, right? I have never done a single workshop uh, online because, you know, we always do it face-to-face. -face. Mm. Uh, but fortunately, I, I'm a little bit of a tech geek, right? So I, I was dabbling with like uh, some audiovisual stuff from July the year before in 2019 because we were trying to do our own video recordings and maybe going to podcasting. And it was just really about uh, content generation. So I learned a little bit about Adobe and stuff. And you know, you, you know, I like what Steve Jobs said. He said, the dots always connect backwards. So at that time when I was doing it in July 2019, playing around with all these computer systems, it seemed like a hobby, right? An expensive hobby, to be honest. <laughs> but when the March period came and the client asked, can you run? We, I learned one thing uh, from my mentors in business, always say yes. <laughs> and they go figure out, okay, how do I make this happen? Always say yes, right? So I said, yes. Uh, and then they said, okay, we got to run on like Monday. And this was like a Thursday. And we were like, okay, how do we get all of this done? How do we book Zoom? And how do we uh, send the email invites? How do we register? How do we do the cybersecurity? Oh my goodness, so many things. But fortunately, uh, my team uh, was really gung-ho and, and they knew that this was a, was, a, was a make it or break it type of a moment. We cannot say no. So we then pulled the entire thing. And from there, uh, Edric, uh, it was really just amazing how um, the business kind of really shifted. Uh, of course, our revenues dropped uh, significantly, mm. but our margins went up because we no longer had all the additional costs, such as right. venue and food and none of that, right? Um, and it and we were able to do more within the same time because mm. if let's say I have to train a company in Vietnam on Monday, then on Tuesday I can do a Singapore-based company. Because I didn't, I didn't have the travel uh, time, you know. In the past, we always can only book Monday and then maybe Wednesday. Uh, sometimes we book it Thursday to have some rest in between. But now we could do back to back. We could also do uh, morning and afternoon sessions for two completely different companies, which was not possible in the previous business model, where mm. we had to travel from place to place. Keynote speeches, 
was fantastic because now we could uh, deliver online speeches. And my biggest one was, was with Oracle, where we covered um, the entire world, right? Uh, whoever wanted to dial in could dial in. So we had participants from Sweden and like from Turkey, from far, far away places. And I thought, wow, this is pretty cool, you know? Um, and we ended up clocking uh, myself alone about 700 hours of training and facilitation last year. And when I sat down to do the math, it was like, that's a lot of time, um, uh, you know, doing facilitation um, uh, overall. So I think uh, the last year was a very significant year for not only my business, but I think almost every other business out there. Um, a lot of retrenchments, businesses had to change their business model. Some were, you know, during the circuit breaker, they were not allowed to reopen. So a lot of you know, impact happened and we were fortunate and um, lucky to be able to still deliver content and deliver value to the customers and, um, you know, uh, be flexible about the entire thing. Yeah. So this year it has put us in a much uh, better state because the customers realize, oh, it works, you know, like this online stuff has its own um, uh, perks compared to the face-to-face uh, -face training. So this year we have also scheduled quite a fair bit. And that's why this month, April, is really a, a really awesome month. It's really packed for us. But also we need to manage our, you know, work-life balance a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. What's be, but what's the experience uh, in, uh, been like for you in terms of the difference, right? We're so used to being in front of people, yeah. right? Uh, delivering, having the courses and really interacting. Now you're yeah. giving keynote sleep speeches online. Um, yeah. Is there a different thrill from from that or do you uh, now feel more self-conscious like hey what's my hair gonna look like what's this gonna look like? is the lighting right you know there's so much so many different worries now you know okay i'll tell you there's only one real difference for me when you do keynote speeches in front of um, an audience in a room versus when you do it online it is the laughter so when we do uh, it in a in a live environment right like a auditorium or a, you know stage in a hotel the laughter, you know, when you tell something, when you share something, you can feel the vibe of the entire room together. When everybody laughs, we laugh together. When they reflect, they reflect together. And there's uh, ability for them to, you know, have some participation with the friends around them. Um, and we, we used to do um, our keynotes in person. We also have multi-sensory. So mm -hmm. there were things that they could taste. There were things that they will be able to smell. So we did it in a different way in Alvega to make it an immersive experience for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we went online, it was basically facing a wall of um, names because for a lot of times in these keynotes, people don't switch on their cameras, uh, which is understandable uh, because it also puts a lot of strain on the system when everybody has their uh, cameras on. So sometimes, you know, we get them to switch off their cameras. So all I have is like little thumb emojis and like people commenting stuff. Uh, but the difference I found is that there are other digital tools like online whiteboarding. Mm -hmm. We can play Kahoot. You can do um, Mentimeters and things of that nature, which would you can still do it if you were doing it face to face. But I think now it's just more intuitive. Like people can just click the link, go in, participate. So we are able to collect more data uh, from the audience, audience reaction, participation, their opinions and thoughts when it comes to a certain topic. So for me as a speaker, um, really now is I have to look at a camera, right? And the lighting and stuff, I think I've never really been that self-conscious. I just know that it has to look good <laughs> for the people who are watching it. And the sound has to be clear enough for them to be able to um, hear the messages. So we add a couple of things. So I think both of them have their own um, uh, nuances and their, and, their, and their perks, I would say. So if you ask me which one would I prefer... Uh, for efficiency, I will go with the online uh, keynote. But for effectiveness, I think I will still lean on the face-to-face -face where you bring people to an event and have the camaraderie and the fellowship with each other. So yeah, th those were the, the major differences. And we have done both actually in the meantime. So this year in January, I went back to doing face-to-face -face, um, keynotes. Last year in December, I did one where there were 50 people allowed in a room. Singapore, you know, they relax the rules. So there were 50 yep. people who can be allowed in the room. It was very weird because everybody was seated like three, two meters apart and, yeah. and everybody had a mask on. And it was like, then my question is, should I make them laugh? Is that, a, is that allowed? So there was all these questions and consideration. But it was fun. Um, and this year, we also have a few more lined up, um, which are, are online so far. But I'm quite sure slowly companies will be like, okay, let's go back to face-to-face, -to -face, you know. 
because there yeah. is that it's it's it has its own uh flavor and an impact yeah i would say Def- definitely definitely yeah. the other time i did the storytelling thing right uh at yeah. uh, uh what's your story slam uh first yeah. thing i went up to uh, to the mic first thing was you know i i asked because my uh, my mask was on so i yeah. just asked so uh, anna are we doing this with or without protection what are we doing so <laughs> i got a couple of laughs here and there but at least um you know it helped to lighten the mood about what mm-hmm. we are really doing yes we do this yeah. and it's for everybody's safety but one yeah. one thing i i think that uh we've gotten we, we we've had a couple of courses here and there right uh, mm-hmm. or, or at least on our end about some sharings on how we can interact better uh, online you know things mm-hmm. like your uh, like what you said the emojis the emoticons the maybe certain mm-hmm. whiteboard functions but um that's the thing how do you get that interaction right and so-called defeat the zoom fatigue and keep people going my biggest concern when it comes to f- um digital events is yeah. i i have this thing uh, basic rule right like people once it's six clicks or more i'm out i'm done because my my user experience is now lost. So how do you mm-hmm. make sure that people are attentive? They're listening. Is there a time frame that you go okay every X number of seconds? I got to make sure that yeah. dang 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 dang. You know. Uh, okay, very good question. So when I when it comes to Zoom, I've learned a couple of things. Right. Uh, mm. Not everybody seated at a computer to uh, tune in. Some people are lying on their couch uh, using a handphone. Yeah. So there are all kinds of learners. Um, sometimes when we do parenting sessions. Parents are actually having breakfast with their children and they're tuning in. So um, I think the key is um, to have as much engagement as possible. So even if you put away all these digital tools, right? If you put all that away, um, I, I, you know, I one of the things I think about when I'm doing all of these sessions is: Am I telling a lot of stuff? You know, am I telling, delivering, or am I actually asking? So I think it's that's where the first balancing comes in, right? I have to share something with the audience of value. At the same time, uh, ask questions to help them to reflect, to think about the material, think about their own situation, think about their own problems. How will they apply? Where do they see the possible applications? So that I found is the first area of engagement with the audience, minus all of the tools, um, is to make the content that I'm sharing contextualized for the audience. So they will be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, I think I can use it in this area. Um, and then they go out to maybe do some practice sessions because in, in Zoom, you may have like the breakout rooms. So yep. people can go in and have a practice. So I think that's where it all starts from. And this is also the same thing when we are doing face-to-face um, the, is whether we are sharing more as a trainer or are we actually asking the audience more so that they are pulled into the topic and they are working on something. Uh, and whether they are doing active problem solving. So I took a lot of those practices that I already did uh, into the virtual space. Uh, and at the, with the virtual space, there's a lot of different tools, right? Opinions, uh, you can ask for like Mentimeter, kind of mm. gives you like uh, different options. Like you have a Q&A, we have a word cloud. So you can use that. Uh, Kahoot is also very popular because it's like a gamified, you know, where people can test their knowledge and, you know, mm. kind of feel good about competing. And then we also have like online whiteboards, like explain everything, uh, Miro. Uh, there's a whole lot. That's where you are trying to do more complex applications where people are doing like, a, you know, concurrent uh, real-time collaboration. Um, so that one needs a little bit of orientation for the audience. They need to understand like, oh, that's how these things are work. Like uh, when you click your mouse and you pull, so the whole canvas moves. So they get used to it, they enjoy it, they find it of great value. And then once the they are familiarized with the tool with one or two simple exercises, then they get into it. You know, I found that people get into it really fast and they mm. found like, oh, okay, this is pretty cool. Let's work on it. And then, you know, what's the best part, Andrik? All of these things can be exported into documents like PDFs and, and whatnot. And we can just send it to them uh, as a, um, something they can, um, you know, uh, capture in their own documents. Uh, data bank for example if they want to refer to it again so if you're asking me how do we actually increase the interaction it's really firstly starting with uh, the way the facilitator or the trainer is talking to the people or the leader uh is it telling a lot or is it asking a lot of questions so i tend to ask a lot of questions the hows the whys the what ifs uh, what do you think and that usually gets everybody's mind like okay they have to be actively thinking and then one of the one of the other things that I use is I will say okay I'm going to randomly just pick people where as and when 
So I was just like, okay, Edric, what do you think? And and people get very used to it very fast. They will realize like, oh, this crazy guy is going to call me anytime. So everybody's quite alert. Right. <laughs> if not, you're the jerk who doesn't respond, right? It's like everybody's like, oh man, this guy probably yeah. like disappeared from the thing, just left his computer on. I mean, I've been yeah. guilty of it, no, to be honest. Yeah. I actually sat for a meeting before while I was actually cooking dinner. <laughs> like chopping vegetables, like my yeah. hands are dirty. I can't touch my phone. And I'm like, oh man, yeah. I'm so dead. I can't answer this. <laughs> I don't yeah. know what to do. It, it, we, I mean, come on. These are, it has happened to all of us, right? Uh, but I think it's it's really just about how we set the frame up and engage people and they need to see the session is of value to them. And mm. when people can see the value, they can see some benefit out of it, people will tune in. So we, we do some sessions which are multiple classes for the same batch, like two hour sessions for you know, every two or three days, for example, for a period of three months. Um, and, and the take up rate is really good. People sign in, they get the flow. They understand that this is an ongoing uh, learning process. So I also see uh, how learning has can change um, for companies because now it is no longer about just going in for a two day, but it can be spread over three months with mm -hmm. uh, ongoing activities for them. And you can have videos that supplements their learning, for example. So I see this as a great uh, change uh, for co companies because it's easier for people to take up a two hour thing rather than like a two full day thing. Um, mm -hmm not only because of the time, right? But it's also the absorption rate. How much can really people absorb within two days? Yeah. And then what are you expecting them to do after the two days without any support or coaching? So it's a really good a kind of like a, a rethink about the model. So all the training providers and, and management consulting companies have now an opportunity to rethink their solutions, right? So it doesn't have to be like by day. Uh, they can do it even like two hours or three hours. And then in the afternoon, you still have time to do another organization. So I think that's really exciting and it opens up a lot of opportunities. Mm. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great point because uh, the previous podcast that I did with uh, Levine Hamlani from Accelerate, he was also mentioning that training programs now and the way that people are consuming the content really, mm. really does change the way that, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the way that we are um, living our lives right now and the environment that we have, mm. the way that we are consuming content now is so different. Yeah. And now learning is no longer like what you said, sit down for two days. We don't, ain't nobody got time for that, right? Yeah. We're just going to have to take things uh, yeah. as and when we want it. So a lot of this mm -hmm. content now is it has to be on demand. You know, Absolutely. Netflix is Netflix is Netflix for a reason. Spotify is Spotify yeah. for a reason. Absolutely. People take it at their own time, you know, and yeah. this is a great thing. But my question has all uh, on this is that for softer skills, mm -hmm. look, uh, the, the word soft skills, right? Some maybe yeah. kind of uh, irks some people, but I always wanted to also know how can you really tell or teach mm -hmm. somebody uh, soft skills, so to speak, public speaking, just by listening or something like that. So you've gone through many things like um, Singapore's Orator of the Year Award, you know, yeah. uh, things like that. You have won many, many, many awards in public yeah. speaking. Um, it's too, so I was too free at that time. <laughs> you were what? <laughs> I was too free at that time. So I, um, <laughs> you know, I didn't have a girlfriend. So I said, okay, I'll take part in speech competitions. <laughs> so the thing is this. How yeah. does somebody, number one, right, get involved yeah. with um, giving speeches and eventually l gearing up to become a keynote speaker? How, how did you even get started in that? Okay, so um, or the journey of public speaking you're in. Yeah. Okay, so I, had a, I have a very encouraging dad, right? So it started all the way back in primary school and it started with storytelling. So I, I've always felt like if anybody wants to learn how to be a good public speaker, you know, start off just by telling stories. And if you can tell a story, relate a story to someone, even for two to three minutes, that's a great starting point. And then the next thing is you evolve from that one story to telling, you know, sharing a little bit more, maybe making a point. And then the rest of it comes together, right? So it's like your body language, what are things you need mm -hmm. to be mindful of, uh, your voice, your emphasis. Because if you're speaking in English, you need to understand the stress patterns. Where do you stress? When do you stress? And in keynote speaking, it isn't exactly like, you know, talking to a friend. It's not like a conversation. There are things which are different, right? Like we emphasize certain things. So you bring the message out in people. So there's that, I don't know, that artistic subjective part of it. 
uh, versus if you go up on stage and then you talk and then there's no emphasis whatsoever. And, you know, I've seen people who sometimes deliver their keynotes this way. And after like two minutes, people are like, oh, my goodness, this is such a torture. In great content, but poor delivery. So you mm -hmm. want to make sure that the content and delivery thing comes together. And then uh, I think subsequently, I just always ended up uh, being that kid in class who was doing the presentations. Um, and then I slowly moved into debates, right? So I did a, quite a lot of debates in Singapore um, and one international one. So I think all that gave me the exposure and I read a lot about public speaking. And the thing, you know, honestly, that accelerated my growth was watching keynote speakers for hours at end. So I had them on loop, right? All these uh, wonderful speakers. Back in the day, it was uh, DVDs, do you remember? <laughs> and some VHS, yeah, I had some VHS yeah. uh, tapes and some... I know I make it sound like I was like from another era, but you know, these were the things that were available, handed down to me to buy some mentors. So I used to yeah. watch like Dale Carnegie and you know, some of these older older folks and just look at, okay, how do they present their, their themselves? And then I used to um, mimic, imitate them over mm. and over and over and over again um, to get the patterns into my system, like get it in, make it more natural for myself. So, so you're that's emulating them. Yeah, emulating them. And then stand-up comedians, right? So I mm. used to watch a lot of them and then repeat their jokes um, exactly the way we would do it to get the cadence and to get the feel of how they do it until I found my own way and approach that works best for me. Right, but so who did you model a, after in, uh, for the stand-up comics? Carlin or...? Um, I think uh, there was this guy called Carlos um, uh, Mendes, if I'm not wrong. Mencia. Yeah, Mencia. Yeah, so I kind of oh, okay. like a lot of his, uh, his very aggressive tonality. Um, I think a little bit of, um, I would say, the names are not coming directly to my mind right now. But if you like Mencia, uh, then you would have gone with George Lopez as well, right? Yeah, George Lopez. Jones. Yeah, so <laughs> some of these guys, yeah. Um, and of course, Eddie Murphy, to just see how they do it, you know. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of others who I'm not uh, mentioning right now, but they because they all become a mishmash for me in my head, mm -hmm. like how they, they do what they do. Um, and so I did a lot of study on humor. How do you become funny? What is funny? What is not funny? What is appropriate humor for as, in corporate environments? How do you link things up? So I think all those uh, kind of really help to understand the various tools in keynote speaking. So if you think mm -hmm. about it, speaking is just a set of tools. Um, some people only have one tool, which is their voice, and they can pull it off with a, an amazing voice. They can move an entire audience of a thousand people. Uh, but I think, you know, sometimes when people come for a keynote speech, they want more. They want a little bit more entertainment value. They want um, something more. They don't just want a dry kind of like a academic speech. They yep. want it to be mixed. They want to be involved. They want to be engaged. They want to go on a journey with you. So I think all of those things kind of like um, have to be uh, blended in. Yeah. It's and also incorporating together. the companies, uh, and also incorporating the companies, um, you know, perspective. What do they want out of the keynote as well? Yeah, it's no, I, I love you, your entire journey. I love your entire journey. You started off with storytelling. You learned from uh, public speakers. You were emulating them. You got yeah. the humor a yeah. bit. So these were the building blocks of keynote speaking. Of course, yeah. content and substance must be there as well, right? You can't just yeah. talk shit there for 45 minutes and, and make people laugh. That was <laughs> that's a completely different thing, right? Yeah, it's absolutely true. Um, and knowing uh, and having a lot of empathy for the audience, you know, what is mm. it that they are feeling and um, to talk about their fears, I think in a way that helps them to process it and go beyond it. So I think right. those are the things that I learned in, in keynote speaking. And it's, it's really special. Um, and, you know, if you really think about what a keynote is, it's the key presentation that is going to set the tone for a conference, for example, which might run two or three days. So there's a lot of pressure, you know, when you are a keynote speaker to make sure you you establish that nice, wonderful opening that helps people to all tune in. So I've done like innovation based keynotes. I've done change uh, based keynotes. And they are going to run another two or three days of their own internal facilitation workshops and other speakers coming up. So the keynote speaker really has a job of opening everything up and setting the tone, uh, making it conducive for everybody else who's coming after you. So, yeah, <laughs> but no pressure, no pressure. You know, you tell us there's no pressure, but there's a lot of pressure for weeks before the, the event actually happens. Mm. Yeah, you've done so many keynotes, right? Um, and like what you mentioned, innovation tracks. You've also done yeah. uh, change management and all that. Now the yeah. thing is, people come and listen to keynotes on change management, right? Now 
yeah. how do you even set the tone for change management? You gave the three tips just now, yeah. but how do you even set the tone for these guys to go, look, okay, I really, really have to look into it rather than think my organization's the best? Okay, so um, the question is, how do I talk to them about change management? Am yeah. I right? Yeah, so I know the word change management sounds so heavy and it sounds complicated, um, but think about it as transitions. Everybody in the room, you know, including yourself and me, we have been through transitions, small ones, big ones, major ones, tough ones. So we have to shift from um, just think about change as an episode, but think about it as the period in between, the transition that happens. And so what are some things that will accelerate your transition and what are some things that could potentially hamper or even disrupt your transition? I think when we start getting into those kind of like conversations, people really do perk up. And, you know, I use a lot of family stories and my own uh, experiences and also some case studies from some of our previous clients. People go like, that is so relatable. You know, that is something that I can, I can relate with. So once something is relatable, you will find the audience will want to engage um, and listen. And, you know, sometimes people really just don't care about their companies. <laughs> mm. Although the companies would love everybody to, to, be, to think about the company as number one priority. The company is, um, you know, it really depends on how, how it's um, run and the culture and whether it really has built a great bond with their team or staff. Uh, but ultimately, it comes back down to people. Where am I going? What is my journey going to look like? How can I work with my colleagues? So for the keynote speaking, I think um, we take the topic first and then we have to deconstruct it to also inject our own personality. So one thing I ask myself is, what is it that I as Ramesh can bring into this topic that someone else maybe can't? So I to bring my own um, you know, style, my own stories and experiences. So you can have five speakers speaking about keynote uh, on change and they'll all be very different. You know, there could be some similarities in terms of the models and you know, everybody talks about William Bridges model or you have the, you know, the the model of change, uh, the seven steps, for example. But other than that, beyond that, what else is going to really help the people uh, to take the next step forward? So I kind of like have some areas that I'll focus on, like on relationships, on roles, on conflicts, um, and how these can, uh, you know, how we can better deal with these things instead of letting them fester and become something toxic and everything just doesn't move. So we have to do it in a nuanced way, I would say. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it helps and, the people uh, do it. Yeah. Do industries make a difference? Um, do industries make a difference? I mm. think companies make a difference. I wouldn't so go so far as to say industries make a difference. But definitely, for example, the finance uh, industry, right? They have some of the most motivated people. You know, really, they, they are so inspired. So sometimes when I do a keynote for them, I'm like, I think you guys, you know, your team is already so inspired. Uh, and because they also spend per capita the most amount of money in their education of their own, um, uh, you know, their people. So you can see a company where there's been a lot of ongoing serious development work. The motivation levels are pretty good. So when they come in, they click. Uh, for companies where there is a existing, you know, sort of like a disengagement, right, where people are really not engaged or they have trust issues with their leadership. So I have done keynote speeches where they were trying to via a keynote speech to repair the trust levels. But, you know, you and I know it's not going to happen. You mm -hmm. can't like through a keynote speech, people have an enlightenment. People have to be committed to a serious change. And sometimes there's some healing to do. You know, people have to come to a room and be like, hey, I'm really upset with you because you did this thing and you did this thing. But if they don't want to do those uh, difficult uh, facilitated workshops, then mm -hmm. uh, we're going to come back to, uh, okay, it was a really nice uh, window dressing, I would call it for the, for the trust issues. So um, engineering companies, engineering industries, I think they are very receptive when things are structured for them. And, you know, you explain to them things in logic. Um, in some other places, I think it's just uh, getting them to focus on a single thing becomes so difficult because they have multiple things happening at the same time. So getting the... Everybody thinks... Everybody says, yeah, the topic is important, but we have another five more things we have to look at to help them to make that into a key uh, area of uh, emphasis and why that is going to make a big difference for their development for the year, for the company, to help them reach their results. Yeah. So right. it wouldn't be in the, by industry, but it's more of company culture. So some companies have fantastic culture. People love their leadership. They, mm. they trust everyone. And in some companies, you can go in and you see it's a very low trust environment. Everybody's just very cautious of everybody else, you know, and no one's really right. opening up to share. So they've literally asked you to come in to 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 repair 
the corporate yeah. culture. <laughs> uh, happens, happens. Um, no. Yeah, because they, no. they, yeah. <laughs> yeah, why why do they even do that? Like, first of all, right. So that means they don't okay. realize. Number one, they don't recognize the problem. Is is that the key? is that the problem? I think they have um they have some problem recognition. They understand there's a problem because of the mm. symptoms, right? People quitting and things not happening when results are not being reached. People get okay, right. uh, a little bit cautious. But I think this is where the solution awareness part is lacking because they think in their mind a key note will be the solution. So yes, it is a solution. To what extent? To what is it going to remedy? I think it can start a conversation going in the organization if the company is willing to continue the conversation subsequently. But if it's not, then it just kind of like ends in that 45 minutes and it was like, oh, that was a great speech. Oh yeah, a lot of good points. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's sometimes they just need to uh, be shown a plan how exactly you know, they can move forward in the next few months um, and of course, everybody wants guarantees, right? Will this definitely work? So I, this is what I often tell my, my clients. I say there's no guarantee that this will work. But there is a guarantee that if you don't do something, it's just going to get worse. Mm. <laughs> and they'll be like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And they're like, okay, let's try something. You know, That's... because um, when you, you can't put the burden of guarantee on any one person. It is a full organizational uh, commitment. You know, the KPIs have to be relooked. And yep. sometimes you have to do manpower reallocation, meaning if a certain leader is not working out for the team, then you have to bite the bullet and say, okay, let's change the leader. But if you keep, you know, not wanting to make these difficult changes or these tough changes, and then the cycle will just repeat and then the good people, the talented people will leave and yeah, it, it's just not healthy. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're from from where you and I were from, right? Uh, previously, yeah. and and all this, uh, and your current experience of people coming in and asking you, you know, hey, fix the problem. You know, uh, my people are not motivated. Can you come in and motivate them? You know, is it yeah. because do you sometimes feel that people are asking you, right? Uh, they have this concept. Oh, motivational speaking uh, is brainwashing because some of the things that yeah. you do is motivational speaking. But yeah, is I mean, let's address the elephant in the room and clear yeah. this up because you know. How do you deal with that when people think that okay, way? Okay, so I think um, brainwashing, right? So I do a lot of, I did a lot of research on cult groups and also um, how do you subjugate a human being to make them lose, you know, pure, perfectly educated, you know, people with good uh, cognitive functions. How do you make mm -hmm. them do certain things? So I think um, that is really not the aim of the work that I do anyway, uh, which mm -hmm. is to make people lose sense of their, their self uh, their individuality, right? But what we are doing is we are um, expanding, right? We are expanding their resources. We are expanding the way they look at a certain thing to get them to reflect on something, to enable them with some problem-solving thinking, right? So motivational speaking in no way is brainwashing, but you can say it's a lot of uh, a lot of pulse of energy and and vigor and. Um, you know, like um, examples that hopefully shakes a little bit of the negativity that they may be having uh, mm -hmm. when they are in the session. So it kind of just shakes things up a little bit, like a good stretch, or like a good massage. You know, it really gets the blood flowing. But in the end, we always want people to be connected to who they are on the inside. That's how I do my work. You know, I want them to be connected to who they are, their own passions, their own goals, and why this is important to them. Because that's where it all starts. And then mm. if a couple of people come together and they have similar passions, then I think we can create magic in that space. Yeah, so is motivational speaking, brainwashing. I think um, there are people out there who do it. You know, they use a lot of techniques uh, mm. from, um, you know, some, some methodologies, right, to kind of get people to shift their mind. But I think at the end, if the person doesn't feel connected to themselves, then I think it won't last anyway. It will be right. just around for a couple of weeks and then people lose it. But if it's kind of sparked something deep in them, a creative thing in them, like I want to create something in my my career, in my life, then okay, I think we have done a pretty good job. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> because it so, essentially is like hypnosis, right? It taps into your yeah. subconscious. But if you cannot yeah. or will not do something and it's against your moral compass and your yeah. ethics, you probably won't do it, right? Yeah. 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 So this question has come up many times. Is is, is uh, motivational speaking brainwashing? Yeah. Um, uh, I've had some speakers who say, yeah, they absolutely need to be brainwashed. But I think we have to be careful when we use the word brainwashing because it's mm. it's something pretty serious. It's really yes. a, a willful 
uh, shift that you're doing in people to make them sort of like lose their sense of, uh, uh, you know, ownership of themselves and their individual, um, you know, agency, basically. Mm. Um, so I think we want to be careful of the word brainwashing. But I think, right. yes, we are doing something to inspire them to to expand their, their mind and make them more creative, you know. And, right. and that's my intent anyway. <laughs> right. I, I see it as a lot more of a refinement. And yeah. uh, I would say like uh, it's it's cleaning. I won't say it's brainwashing, yeah. but there's some cleaning, you know, to your spirit, to your soul and alignment, yes. you know, of all this. It's, it's like going to a chiropractor, you know, you got to get everything fixed up properly <laughs> and get it aligned and then you feel a lot better. But uh, much like going to a chiropractor, they'll keep telling you, keep coming back. You know, there's not yeah. one alignment and everything fixes up because it's bound to happen anyway. You know, yeah. and so I, I, you know, this this thing about motivational speaking and getting yeah. motivated and people mm-hmm. trying to find their way, right? Uh, mm-hmm. What you mentioned was, again, very, very close to what we've talked about, you know, off the air yeah. as well. And how do you find your purpose? So okay. number one, right, what is the thing that you would ask to inspire that thought, am I doing myself justice? Am I doing the right thing? Am I on the right way to finding my mm-hmm. purpose? Okay, so for this one, I want to share with you an example, right? So let's say we have to build a bridge, right? We have mm-hmm. to build a bridge. And on one point, it's shorter and another point is higher, right? And you ask a person, you got to build a bridge. I'm trying to I'm trying to make it as, as obvious as possible. <laughs> what do you think is most people's solution? And I have to build a bridge across. What do you think is most people's solution? It's connect one point to the other. Yeah. Just but one, one side is another. lower and one side is higher. So what should uh-huh. we do to, to make this work? Wow. Okay. That's a... That's it's an, an interesting question. Now, I'm yeah. trying to figure out what's the engineering principle here. <laughs> yeah. So let's say one, 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 like one side is piece, higher I mean. and one side is lower, right? Uh-huh. Which side am I on? Um, it doesn't matter. Um, and as a, and you, if you have to build a bridge across, what would be the solution? Well, you got to get the materials. And let's just assume, okay, it's the simplest and simplest of bridges. If you can just take a long slab yeah. uh, so then it'll be it'll enough. be tilted right the bridge will yep. be tilted how do i make yep. it level oh wow one side is high one side is low so what do i do uh. great that means you have to build on the other side to level it out either or dig down yeah. right so i think you 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 have mentioned what a majority of people do the idea is whichever side is lacking we want to top up so that it becomes level right uh-huh and that is one solution. That is one solution. Right. But another solution is to actually reduce the height of the other side uh-huh. so that it becomes level, right? Right. So this is what I call the principle of subtraction. The principle of subtraction. So if you look at Mary Kondo and this entire minimalist movement, they always right. ask, you know, is it really necessary? Right. What is most essential for us? But also in human psyche, I think sometimes more is better. They want to have more things, right? So companies have more schemes, more more stuff. So f- I found finding the purpose is not a game of addition, but rather a game of subtraction. What does this mean? It means you have to start eliminating things that are non-essential to your life, eliminating things that you're not good at, right? And it's really not something that you vibe with at all and mm. kind of getting rid of it. And it's only when you keep getting rid of stuff you have a few things that's left. And then you ask yourself, why am I still holding on to these things? Because maybe they have some value. And I found it's much easier to find your purpose when you remove a lot of things away uh, which are not essential. And I think this is what gets a lot of people stuck because everything seems so important. Like in a house cleaning, right? right. Everything is important to me. Yeah. So you so got to Marie Kondo yourself. Yeah, you got to Marie Kondo your way, you know, and getting <laughs> rid of a lot of stuff. So what is it that really makes uh, it's important to me? Uh, relationships, maybe having quiet time um, and understanding your personality. I think that's important. Many people maybe figure it out and they think that, oh, I'm going to change my personality to suit my purpose. While you can do that temporarily, but Uh you will constantly have this battle with who you are really on the inside. So once we are able to kind of triangulate, right, who am I as a person, my personality, and you got to be honest with yourself. If you're not a Mm -hmm. social creature, then you're not. Of course, you can learn to be more social, but Internally, you know you're a person who prefers the hermit life or you prefer, Mm. you know, to be just in a little cottage with your, you know, your books and stuff like that. And then asking yourself, okay, what kind of lifestyle do you think I really would want? And sometimes you don't know until you try it, right? 
whether you want a high life or you want a medium life or a simple life or a very, you know, you know, what kind of lifestyle you want, a country life, you want a city life, then looking at then why am I here? What is it that I can do that will be of service to others that will somehow shift the world in just a little, in a, in a better way? And so that purpose finding I found is also connected to service. Like how mm. can you be of service to the world around you? So when we triangulate these three things, then you'd be like, ah, okay, I think I kind of know where I'm supposed to be headed, where I want to go. So there was the Japanese concept of uh, um, ikaki. Ikigai, right? Ikigai, sorry. So they also had that multiple circle. So it's it's somewhere around that same idea. But what I found to be very useful is helping people to subtract things that are not essential to them first. Mm. So you can also subtract your way to success, right? So sometimes a trainer, a speaker, they want to do so much. They want to be so many things. But sometimes all it takes is to remove all of these things that are non-essential and focus on that one key thing that's going to be really the thing that drives you forward, mm. um, at least in that time frame, to the next level of success. So focusing, it helps you to focus and concentrate on things. Mm. Yeah, there's there's a running joke that I use with other people. I, I do ask them, you know, so what's your definition of success? They tell me, you know, and I always yeah. ask them as well. So what is the quickest road to success? They, they say, oh, it's, you know, whatever, whatever. I tell them, no, the quickest road to success is mediocrity. <laughs> your standards are so okay. low, you can achieve them real quick. Then you succeed mm. yeah, it's possible <laughs> so um, uh, anyway the point the yeah. point of all of this i love what you were mentioning about finding the purpose first you know and because mm -hmm. we came or at least i've always had the impression that uh setting your goals this and that you know and wow reaching yeah. this and attaining that but if you don't have your purpose any of these goals right well you you'll basically yeah. um lose uh, lose steam along the way and you lose yeah. focus you lose that vision you know do you do does that come across as as some to to many of your clients as well uh in terms of the wanting to set goals first uh, is that what you're yeah, asking yeah. correct um okay, they end so up setting you, goals first before getting the purpose um so i think we we cannot be too linear about the journey right oh, okay. so sometimes the way forward is to the way forward which means just take the next step forward set a goal and as you progress towards the goals, right, um, I think the purpose will become more revealed to you. Uh, you feel either warmer or colder. If it's warmer, it kind of feels like this is exactly what I need to be doing. And it, when it becomes colder, it becomes like, why am I feeling so distant and disconnected from mm -hmm. this entire uh, uh, thing? So I don't think we need to be so fixated on whether the purpose comes first or the goal comes first, although it sounds very neat. Uh, but it's a refinement process, I believe. Like you may have an idea of what your purpose may be, um, because what is purpose essentially is is um, a mission, right? It's it's like um, something I got to do, right? I'm a tool, right? I'm a tool. So if I'm a tool, <laughs> what is what am I going to be used for? What am I building here? What am I going to be an instrument, a part of, right? Um, and I think that kind of thinking may, may help a person to understand their purpose. Because I've also had conversations with some people who don't really think purpose is a big deal. They don't think it's like, what purpose do you need? Your purpose is to live, right? So there are many, many different... It, it, it goes into spirituality. It goes into mm -hmm. philosophy. Another one that I, I kind of really like is like, if you truly want to live, you have to first embrace the art of dying. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, that sounds like a morbid idea. But when you deep dive into that philosophy, right, uh, by, you know, some of the great philosophers, it's really about coming to terms with your mortality. Eh? Like, I know mm. I'm going to go at some point, right? So now that I know I'm going to go at some point, how am, I, how am I going to live out the rest of my life? Am I going to live out my life in fear and worry and stress and anger? Or do I want to live out every day as beautifully as possible, even though I may have some not very nice days? Because if I have as many beautiful days as possible, when it links together, chains up together, hey, that's a pretty beautiful life, I would say. Mm -hmm. When I look back, right, in hindsight, I think I did a lot of good stuff. I helped a lot of people. I, you know, I, I looked after animals or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's really this, um, and everybody is different. The way you find your purpose is going to be so different from someone else. And having a prescription doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so for some people, it's through service that they discover their purpose. For some people, it's setting goals. Uh, for some people, it's through failures, you know. It's only when you really, really fail in something really badly, it's when you're at your lowest point, when it feels so dark, then you start to wonder, what's the point? Should I still carry on? What's this all about? And then some things will be revealed to us. 
So that's why this purpose finding thing is a very individual process mm. and, and different people find. Some people find their purpose so easily, you know, like, okay, oh, yeah. my purpose is to be a doctor and that's what I'm going to be. And they, and they kind of figure that out at nine years old and they just go, 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 go. And some people, we are 49 years old and we're like, why am I here? Oh, yeah, why am I doing this, right? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly one of the things I wanted to ask as well. Like, yeah. does it come with a certain sense of maturity or is it some people are just blessed to, to get it, uh, you know? Mm, I, I, I wouldn't be so quick to say it's blessed, but I think um, it will come when it comes. When it happens, it happens when you are ready, right? So sometimes your purpose may be so immense or strange or difficult that you need to go through a lot in life to be ready enough to for the purpose to be revealed to you. You know, so it's okay. Be patient. Sometimes even if you're 50s, you might be like, what's the purpose of my life? It, might, it will reveal to you uh, mm. through the course of your work. So for me, right. I think it's when I spoke to companies and I see the joy in people's faces and leaders coming up to me after that and saying, hey, that really, really um, makes a difference to my team. I mm. find that people are working better together. You know, I got this team in Indonesia, for example, to get motivated. And, and it was really because people felt underappreciated. They felt like uh, they were just being used as objects, you know. Then when, when certain things were done differently, then I said, okay, that's something I really want to continue doing. Do the does the purpose change div, uh, at different junctures? I think I'm also open to that. Uh, that mm. we may not always have a one singular journey like a movie, right? Yeah. There's also the sequel. What happens next? And the purpose yeah. is often if, uh, but the purpose I think overall for human nature could be to do good. You know, to do good, leave the world a better place than we even found it. Mm. Uh, because I don't think our purpose is to accumulate a lot of money and wealth and just power. I don't think that is the purpose. But some people make that to be their life's purpose. So okay, mm -hmm. fine, good on them, right? Indeed, uh, I indeed. I think there's more to that. Yeah. Oh, definitely. I mean, the villains of the world will stay, you know, with the villains of the world, you know. It's, uh, yeah. Yes. No, I expect to die with the bond. The conversations around purpose often get, you know, reflective, isn't it? We, we yes. often reflective. We often get like, definitely. okay, well, what is purpose really? Um, yeah. It is just a reason for why you do what you do, right? That's the purpose. Mm. Yeah. So All for right. children, I mean, the purpose. For children, the purpose is to play. Yeah, for children, the purpose is to play. You know, uh, for younger people, it's courtship. <laughs> that is really yeah. their, uh, their, their purpose, to play, to have friends, you know, to have uh, good relationships. Um, right. To do something for the community around them. So those are, I think, uh, pretty personal and it could be cultural as well because, you know, in different cultures, they also embed uh, different ideas to people. Mm. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that somebody said uh, the other time was with... Um, about finding your purpose, right, is one, what would you die for? Mm. You know, so it kind of, it's also very close to what you're also saying about, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, assessing your mortality or embracing your mortality. Yeah. You know, and uh, thank you so much for very, very nicely um, <laughs> articulating this thing called YOLO. <laughs> yeah, you live only once. Uh, yeah. So so, um, you know, sometimes uh, I think the purpose of life is to live in the present moment mm. and it's not to be yearning for another better tomorrow. So mm. if I can just embrace this wonderful time that we are having together, then that's really my purpose, to be in the present as much as possible. But it doesn't sound so good if you're trying to sell a motivational workshop, right? Yep. Uh, it doesn't kind of like get people excited, like, oh, I'm going to achieve something because you're constantly putting people into future projection. To always mm. be, oh, it's, some, it's something out there. But what if it's already here right now? And mm. my purpose is to enjoy the cup of coffee, is to enjoy the conversation, enjoy the beautiful music, enjoy the wonderful weather, enjoy the rain. Yesterday, it rained like crazy oh, yesterday, right? Fantastic. But what if my purpose oh, really yeah. is to just be in the present moment? And is that so wrong um, to live my life? But people often think, oh, that's being irresponsible. You're not, you know, <laughs> looking out ahead. But I beg to differ. I think um, we can look at things differently, uh, yeah. be more present. So the purpose of a training, for example, is to come together in this current time to see what are the things we can do now, today, together to kind of help us to take the next step. So it's not about constantly doing future projection conversations uh, because, you know, to what extent can you really see all of that? But you can set, uh, you know, some brass tacks. Like, okay, this is kind of what I want to be doing and then try to work towards those things. But not forgetting that the purpose is to do the best at every single moment now. Yeah. All right. Uh, and and for those who are actually thinking that I can be a hundred percent, hundred and ten percent every day, every moment of my life, uh, true, true or false? Uh, I think it's false, and that's too stressful for yourself, right? 
So I also say like the sun doesn't always shine at the same level of brightness on a daily basis. Some days they are overcast. But that doesn't mean the sun doesn't exist. You don't wake up at 11 o'clock and go, did the sun come out today? The sun is there, but it's just you can't see it because it's really just a different weather, different season. So be kind and easy on yourself because the sun will shine, it will shine again. It will rise, you know. So I like to use that metaphor quite a fair bit. Um, and be kind to yourself. Don't be so harsh on yourself. Sometimes you need to rest, heal up. Uh, you just need to disconnect and that's okay. Even if our people around you don't understand why. Yeah. Right. right. It's an oversold concept of being extremely motivated all the time. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what you call a universal truth. Okay? <laughs> and everybody needs to believe that. Okay? Whether you believe the earth is round or it's flat. All right? If you're a flat earther out there and if you are actually listening, right, congratulations. Okay? This is called universal truth. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ramesh. And we have yeah, one more segment you. that we always do. Uh, with our guests at the end of the show and that is called the epic questionnaire so it's a rapid fire game that we have and just answer the questions uh, as quickly as you can with the first thing okay. that comes to mind all right so ready. let's go epic questionnaire with Ramesh Mutusami of Alviga are you ready Ramesh I'm ready I'm ready all <laughs> right cool so first question of the epic questionnaire is one word that you love the most the word is love that's my favorite word. That is your favorite word, love. And one word that you dislike the most? Idiot. Because I don't <laughs> think anyone is an idiot. Although their behaviors might be idiotic, but I don't think that is a label anyone deserves to have in, uh, in their life. Your action doesn't define you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you can have a conversation with one person, fictional, non-fictional, dead or alive, who would that be? I think I would like to speak to my um, great, 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 great grandfather to learn about uh, what drives him and what's his passion and what's his hopes for the future generations. I would really like to connect with my, my ancestors and talk to someone from my lineage from a long time ago to know how they lived and how they, they were. Yeah. Very interesting. What do you say to yourself in the mirror every morning? I look at myself in the mirror and I say to myself, oh my goodness, you are so good looking. <laughs> and I really, do, <laughs> I really do. Because I, I, I struggled with that for many years, you know, that whole self-love thing. And after going through a lot of uh, training and therapy work, I realized that was so important to have a really wonderful feeling when I see myself in the mirror. And also to have a kind of like a comforting kind of like, hey, dude, how are you doing, man? Rather than nice. to have like, oh my goodness, what's this? <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Now, Name one superpower that you'd like to have. Uh, the ability to uh, shift time like Doctor Strange. I think that's a superpower I really love to have. So that I can go back and uh, redo things. <laughs> or go oh. into the future and see how things are going to be. Multiple possibilities, multiple yeah. scenarios and all that. Yeah. Nice. Favorite dish to eat? Uh, wow, this changes. But I would say all-time favorite would be biryani. Mm. <laughs> uh, Chicken mutton? Uh, probably mutton. Um, you know, the Indian Muslim style, I think that's one of my favorite ways of uh, having biryani. Very comforting. And sharing the biryani with people, you know, I think that's really something I remember growing up. You know, you buy one biryani big packet and then you have mm. two or three friends sharing it in secondary school. Oh my goodness, that joy is absolute. Now I had Malay, Chinese friends, everybody just digging mm. in. I think that was really, yeah. Great. <laughs> not only that, there's something about eating with your hands, right? That oh, also absolutely. makes it more fun. I just don't understand absolutely. why. You know, it, it we're always told not to play with our food. <laughs> yeah, but we, it's, you know, that, that's what I love about the the culture. You know, you're you're yeah. you're told you're not even told to play with your food. Just do it. Yeah, <laughs> and it's to make sure there are no bones and there's nothing that can get choked in your throat. So I think there were a lot of other reasons why they ate with the hand to make sure that um, the food you're eating is safe. And it's yeah, hey, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you eat something with your hands, you can feel the bones, right? Even before yeah. you feed someone or you eat yourself. <laughs> right, true. It's better than eating from your mouth and then taking it out and put it somewhere. But anyway, yeah. that's a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, favorite travel spot or the next travel spot once borders open up for you? I think it would definitely be Vietnam uh, because I really miss uh, the cafes and the culture and the wonderful people. Um, Vietnam is just such a... I think it's a beautiful place. Uh, and mm. I'm not so much of a European, Western country traveler. I'm a very much a Asia kind of a traveler because I really like the photography. You know, when you go there, you take a lot of great photos and it's just the people and the culture. It's just so amazing and drinking the Vietnamese coffee. So I really do miss Vietnam a lot. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, first time I was there was so amazing. I love going to the Biahuai. So you just basically really squat there and just drink, eat, yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the best, the best. Love it. Best. Something in the arts that you've always wanted to do, but you've yet to do so. Um, I think it would be uh, modern dance. <laughs> I thought that is something I always want to give my my try in, you know, the ability to express yourself through the body. So I've done a lot of stuff with arts. Uh, I, I did study literature and all that in school. But I think that's something I would be very interested and intrigued in uh, trying out. Yeah, something more physical, physical. Interpretive dancer. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> I rather, oh man. Okay, that's tough. That's tough. What does retirement look like to you? I think retirement looks like to me countryside, um, good music, great coffee, which I make myself in the morning, uh, birds chirping outside, plantations, um, good internet speed, <laughs> mm. um, and still being able to communicate and talk to people from across the world to be adding value to them. So that's what retirement kind of looks like to me. All right. Come to Pongol on Sundays, man. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you want to be remembered? What's your legacy? Um, he helped me. I think that's what I would like to be remembered by most. Like he helped me. Uh, that if I was able to help anyone or any company in whatever way that I could, that's how I want to be remembered. Yeah, oh, fantastic, fantastic. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of this week's episode of the Epic Podcast. So thank you so much, so Edric, so very much, Ramesh, for joining us. Edric, I'd um, like to also thank you for organizing this because I think the people who are, you know, also the speakers in the podcast, good to get a chance to reflect. Uh, it's a good exercise to think about some of the key things and whoever is tuning in and listening. I think uh, you might find some comfort. Uh, some points you may disagree and that's perfectly okay. I mean, how how boring will the world be if we all agree with everyone, right? And it allows you to form your own opinions on things. And I think that's really important. And thank you for um, you know organizing this this morning. No problem, man. It was my pleasure. I mean, again, everybody gets to learn and uh, you know, anyone can inspire everyone. That's that's really the mantra of this uh, podcast. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks again to uh, Mr. Ramesh Mudazami from El Vega. And if you're interested for any of the courses, right, it's on the screen right now. Uh, go down to alvigor.com, whatever it is that you're looking for in terms of your purpose, knowing who you are, trying to connect with people. Ramesh is the man, okay? Go look him up and go to alvega.com, check it out. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of the Epic Podcast. Now remember to like, comment, and subscribe to Epic Podcasting through our YouTube, social media, and whatever, whatever, whatever it is. And we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Have you, you have a great day. All right, bye everyone.